Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Cynthia Holt. Uh, I am the executive director for the Council of Atlantic Academic Libraries. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody here, uh, both call members and COPLA members. We're, we're fairly evenly split amongst the two consortia in terms of our attendees today. Um, I'd like to welcome you also on behalf of our Digital Preservation and Stewardship Committee, uh, which is the sponsoring or hosting this uh, session today. Um, we have a few housekeeping things before I start, just to let you know that we are recording. Um, the recording and the slide decks and any transcripts will be uploaded to the call uh, website uh, after the webinar. And on also, I will send it out the link out or the notification out to everybody uh, who attended the session or at least who registered for the session. Uh, we ask, I ask that you mute yourself throughout the session unless you're asking a question um, just to, to, to minimize background noise, but also to if uh, to keep your video turned off unless you wish to turn it on to ask a question. Uh, but uh, we have some folks coming in from low bandwidth areas, so we try to minimize as much as possible the draw from the video. Um, so I'm going to start first. Uh, so first off, welcome to uh, Looking Forward 50 Years From Now, Threats to the Durability of Locally Created Content uh, with our speaker, Mark Jordan. Uh, I'll be introducing Mark Jordan in a second, but first I wish to acknowledge um, the territory that we are situated on. I know all of you are coming in from different territories. Uh, we at CALL uh, represent member libraries from across the region, all of whom sit on the unceded and traditional territories of First Peoples. Uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador, our libraries sit on the homelands of the Inuit and of Nunutsiavut and Nukutukavut, uh, the Innu of Natasinan and the Bealtic and the Mi'kmaq peoples. Uh, in Prince Edward Island in Nova Scotia, we find our friends and colleagues situated on the territory of the Mi'kmaq. Um, and in New Brunswick, uh, libraries are found on the land of the Wolostuyuk, Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy peoples. Um, so we at CALL CBPA uh, wish to express our sincerest gratitude to the first peoples who share their ancestral homelands with us all. Um, so thank you all for attending. I uh, just want to give a quick little introduction for Mark. Uh, Mark Jordan is the Associate Dean of Libraries for Digital Strategy at Simon Fraser University. So those of you at COPA will be very familiar with him. Um, he's responsible for library IT, digitization, digital publishing, and digital preservation. Uh, he is a past member of CRCAN's Preservation and Access Committee, a past chair of the Trust uh, CRCAN Platform Technical Working Group, and is vice chair of the Canadiana Trustworthy Digital Repository Audit Working Group. Uh, he's also a member of the COPAL Digital Stewardship Network Standing Committee. Um, Mark is also the lead of COPAL's, or uh, was the technical leads uh, of COPAL's Westfault Service and the PKP Preservation Network. And he's also an active contributor to the Islandora community with a focus on Islandora's digital preservation functionality. Uh, with uh, that, um, just to let you know, you can ask questions throughout the session. Uh, Mark has said, uh, please feel free to ask throughout the session, but you can also, there will be time at the end of the session for, um, for questions. And with that, I'll turn the session over to Mark. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Cynthia, and hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, uh, first, I want to acknowledge that I'm joining you from the uh, ancestral and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples the uh, Squamish, Musqueam, Slovatuth, and Coquitlam First Nations. Uh, as a settler on these lands, I am truly humbled to uh, live, work, and learn on them. Um, oops. So, uh, so the topic of my talk today is looking forward 50 years, threats to the durability of locally created content. And I don't, the, the threats sounds a little bit over dramatic and I think I was over dramatic on purpose there, but I just want to make it clear that even though I see what I'm going to talk about as threats to our ability, that is university libraries, uh, also you know archives, museums, of course, uh, included in that group, uh, you know, general glam sector, but with a focus on academic libraries because of the group that we're, we are here today. Uh, we uh, we have the power to mitigate these threats, to 
to prepare for them and to do something about them to ensure that they don't actually impact our ability to provide access to content we create now 50 years in the future. So by calling them threats, uh, what I'm really meaning is uh, if, we, uh, if we don't recognize these things and we don't do anything about them, something bad is probably going to happen. Um, but again, <coughs> from the we do have the power to uh, to mitigate these uh, these threats. Just going to give you a brief outline here of the the threats. I'm going to go into detail about each one of these uh, imminently. But before I do, I just want to look back 50 years. I, I chose 50 years in the future because it seems to me that 50 years is a, a long time in computer years, and we we really don't know what access in 50 years will look like. Uh, maybe VR, virtual reality, will be a thing in 50 years. It's not It's a thing now, but it's small scale, and we don't use it in libraries very much, um, especially to provide access to our locally digitized collections. Um, so we may have entirely different expectations on the part of our users around how they want to access the content that we create and steward. So that's 50 years in the future. I'm going to look back 50 years just to kind of round us in a timeline. In 1972, 50 years ago, Pong was released. Um, many of you, I'm sure, will uh, remember playing Pong in your early years, if you're my generation. Um, and, you know, it's strange because, you know, this is such a rudimentary computer game, but, uh, it, you know, it, it, it kind of laid fallow for a long, a long time. People, people didn't have access to it really very well, very easily. You can access it now um, through the magic of, of emulation. So a group of computer game enthusiasts, not libraries, not academic digital preservation so much, um, but really in video game enthusiasts figured out, who were computer nerds, figured out how to run a game that was released in 1972 on modern hardware. In fact, the version that I cite here from the Internet Archive, you can run it in your web browser. So web browsers have evolved to the extent where JavaScript running in the web browser and other similar technologies can emulate an operating system from 1972. And the reason I say that is because, again, we, you know, when we all started using web browsers in the mid 90s, we had no, none of us could have foretold that in the near future, web browsers would be so sophisticated that they would be the basis for a virtual operating system. So uh, I guess just a, a data point to support my assertion that we don't have any idea what access or expectations of access to our digital content is going to be like in 50 years. Second and final blast from the past uh, is a reminder that the floppy disk and, and disk drive were patented in 1972, 50 years ago, same year the Pong was released. And this was an eight and a half, I think eight and a half or eight inch floppy. I'm not sure I've never really seen one, <laughs> um, but uh, that was the first floppy disk. And uh, uh, the reason I include this is whereas, you know, uh, you can uh, you can play Pong right now in your web browser if you go to the Internet Archive. But uh, it's pretty unlikely that most of the libraries represented here today have easy access to a floppy drive of any format, three and a half, five and a quarter, or eight inch. Yet at the same time, it is also very likely that uh, many of the libraries here today, represented here today, have floppy disks in their special collections files. So uh, while you know you might think that floppy disks aren't a problem anymore because Computers don't come with them anymore. In fact, it's difficult to find one. Um, we have really just shifted the storage of the, the kind of portable storage of content from floppy disks to the cloud. And uh, I'm sure the cloud in some form will be with us for a long time and it probably in similar forms that we recognize it now. May not change a whole lot at this point. Who knows? But um, I just want to point out that the kinds of assumptions that we had then about storing data outside of a computer, and specifically on a floppy disk, they've been completely obliterated. And 
the challenges that we have now as libraries who practice digital preservation uh, and curation and who collect say authors papers that may contain or other kinds of content that may contain floppy disks to 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 uh, preserve and make accessible within our special collections divisions uh, we we don't really have a good handle on how to deal with these uh, kinds of kinds of content or kinds of media and again uh, 50 years in the future who knows what kinds of challenges that we don't see today will present themselves then that we could have mitigated if we had recognized these some threats to that to ensuring access 50 years in the future uh, back then today so um, with those two you know, kind of nerdy uh, what I think apropos examples of um, the scale of the timeline we're talking about here and I chose 50 years uh, not because it's a significant number, um, mainly because I could find two interesting examples from 50 years ago, but uh, 50 years in the future is one benchmark that we that we uh, can use for um, a likely timeline for still being able, it's still being expected to provide access to content that we create today, so, namely things like digitized newspapers. Um, I, yeah, before the presentation started, we were, people were mentioning OERs, so these are um, born digital uh, educational resources that many of us will be charged with um, stewarding into the future. And there are many other examples. So the first threat that I want to talk about is our tendency, and I mean library leaders, all the way from you know university librarians, all the way throughout the organization, of oversimplifying the problems of digital preservation. And this tendency was recognized as far back as 2000 when Howard Besser uh, wrote a well-known uh, chapter of a book called The Problems of Digital Preservation. And in that, in that essay, he, in that chapter, he identified things like the scrambling problem. Uh, how, do you, uh, how do you keep together multiple files to make up an object? Um, unlike a book where if you chop the spine off a book and threw the pages downstairs, you would likely have page numbers that would let you reassemble that book into a reading, a readable uh, reading order with, with files that make up a, a digital object, a complex digital object. There's really no inherent mechanism for that. At least that was the perception back in 2000. So this is a hat tip to Howard Besser, but I'm gonna give you a few other problems that are different than Howard's, but maybe more recognizable uh, in today's academic libraries. First is you may hear people say uh, that uh, we have an IR and things that we put in the IR are digitally preserved. We put, by, by putting things in an, an institutional repository or any kind of repository, it need not be in a st standard IR, it could be any kind of repository that we have, we're preserving them. And this is not necessarily uh, an oversimplification of a problem uh, in the sense that in some some university libraries, we getting a, getting a preprint into an IR is the first step in getting it in getting that document into a digital preservation pipeline or workflow. Um, and that's fine. Um, in fact, I think it's a good idea. But uh, to simply associate the having something in an IR or other repository with it being preserved is, is a, a vast oversimplification of a set of complex pro complex problems. Um, submitting something to an IR typically, unless there's a lot else going on around that IR with regard to digital preservation, is just uploading it to a website. It's not preserving it digitally. And this is an important oversimplification to recognize because we do not want to, we wanna make sure that people who are talking to stakeholders or content creators like faculty uh, or, or donors to special collections, whoever the people, your, your stakeholders or your partners you're getting content from, we wanna make sure that they understand, that is the, the partners, the collaborators, understand what we are doing with their stuff. If they think we're preserving it indefinitely uh, in the form that they give it to us in, uh, then, there's going to be a there's going to be a, mis, a miscommunication has happened and uh, there's someone's going to be surprised 15 years or 10 years or whenever the 
they find out that we're not actually preserving it or something has happened to it that it is not available in it's the state that they thought it was going to be available in so it's important for front for all library staff who interact with these this group of people this group of partners to understand the distinction between what preservation entails and the kinds of commitments that we as lib as a library or group of libraries are making about a given set of content compared to simply making it making it accessible uh, online another uh, uh, oversimplification that i'm sure we've all heard is that digitizing something is preserving it and again that is not not entirely true uh, it, there are cases where digitizing um, uh, fragile or at risk material is the first step to preserving access to it. So for example, um, a very fragile photograph, you probably want to digitize it once and only once, and you want to preserve that photograph uh, as an analog or physical artifact, but all the access to that photograph uh, or most of the access to that photograph will be done via its digital surrogate thereby reducing wear and tear on the original. Um, but that's not the same thing as saying digitization is, digital is the same as digital preservation. They're not the same. And uh, again, it's important, like in the first case here with uh, depositing items in a repository, it's important to be aware of the distinctions and make them clear to people who are talking about digitization with stakeholders or planning digitization because uh, the the two activities are uh, related, but not not always the same. Third uh, oversimplification uh, is that I'd like to offer to you is that uh, that what that we should not worry about digital preservation or durability in the long term because all we need to do is just migrate our access systems, our digital assets management systems, and uh digital asset management systems are uh remarkably or frighteningly short-lived <laughs> compared to the overall arc or time span that we're talking about here uh if we are using 50 years as a uh, typical period in which we say we want to have we want to make content accessible so we want to make it durable enough that we can access it in 50 years Keep in mind that the average lifespan of a standard digital assets management system like Islandora, Samvera, you, you name any of them, none of them are different, uh, DSpace, what have you, is charitably 10 years, 10 years is the outside between major versions. So if 50 years is our timeline and 10 years is the you know, the maximum shelf life of any given digital assets management system, that's five migrations in that 50 years uh, that, you know, we know we need to do. And, and that's that's okay because we know that migrations uh, like taxes and death are inevitable. But uh, uh, my point here is that not only are they short lived, but they're risky and error prone. And that's because we don't really when we migrate between platforms, and many of you who have, if you haven't done this already for your digital assets management system, you probably have done it for your integrated library system. Um, there's a, it's unlikely that the content that is in the source system is going to be transferred to the target system in, with 100% fidelity. There's always, almost always, I mean, there are probably exceptions, but there, there is, it is normal and expected that when you convert or migrate content from one complex system to another, that some of that, some of the, the content will be either lost or changed in some way, such that it's not the same content. And I mean, it's it's close enough, right? So an example of mark records for uh, migration between two integrated library systems. Uh, there's a, good, a very good chance that the, the vendor that's helping you with this, for example, uh, will be able to take all of the mark data that you have in your old system and put it into and, and move it to the news to their new system 
with some degree of fidelity and accuracy. Um, but if you have custom local fields, for example, which is extremely common in these MARC records, you will need to figure out how, like, where your those are going to go in the target system. And sometimes because of quirks of the technology of the platform or other reasons, you can't, that, that, that translation is not one-to-one. -one. When it comes to digital assets management systems, it's even, it's worse because most digital asset management systems don't don't manage metadata in a in a standardized format. Um, it they can be exported in a standardized format, and that's that's fine. That's a that's a completely suitable alternative to storing it in a in a standardized format. But uh, there's there's still a very high risk that in that in that migration of that metadata that it's going to have to be changed. Whether or not that's a risk to preservation or durability or access in the future, that's, a, that's an open question. Uh, it, it, it may not be, uh, depending on what, you know, what is lost and what is, what is maintained across platforms. But the oversimplification I'm talking about here is that simple migrations or migrations from uh, one platform to another, because these things get old and creaky and we want new or better, uh, they're high risk and we shouldn't see them as a placement for more systematic digital preservation and and stewardship. Uh, just a, one more example on this point, because I think it's a very important one that we often overlook, and that is I've just talked about metadata moving between systems and potential loss of content in that metadata. But when you talk about things like files and uh, the the way that these like like fo images, for example, or video content, and the way that those things are migrated, or sorry, accessed, um, there there's a high risk there as well that the 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 act of migration, the process of migration, is going to change that content in some way. Uh, and so, in a digital assets management system, where you are making your content available, you're making both metadata and uh, content in terms of the, the, the full text, let's, let's call it, available, uh, you have a double, a, a double problem, unlike with an integrated library system where if you're just migrating mark descriptive data, that's pretty, under, pretty well understood and pretty, pretty, well, pretty easy to do if the vendor has their act together. Um, but there are other parts of an ILS migration that may be less successful, like uh, holdings data, for example. Um, the next oversimplification I want to talk about is that uh, um, it is easy to predict what it will cost us to, to do digital preservation over 50 years or over any period of time. And that is extremely difficult to predict for a couple of reasons. Staff costs, and infrastructure costs are not predictable. Staff costs may be a little bit more predictable in some senses than infrastructure, but uh, as time goes on in that 50 year period, uh, you, it is likely that staffing requirements will change. They may not always lessen or become reduced. They may increase. Um, so that's staff. So we can, let's say we can predict staffing costs into the future. Um, I will point out though that staffing costs and staffing needs are uh, related to the kinds of activities that you do. So if you become, if you do more digital preservation as time goes on, uh, you will need more staff. And you may not know that now. So that's gonna have an impact on the predictability of the costs. Infrastructure is really difficult. Uh, again, it's, it oversimplifies the case to say, well, disk storage is just getting cheaper all the time. Um, well, that is generally true. Uh, it is also generally true that as time goes on, we want to store more stuff. So yeah, you may see disk storage, let's call it storage costs decrease uh, precipitously or a little bit more gradually. But if you are requiring more and more storage over time, uh, that those, those decreases in cost for the storage are going to be offset and probably surpassed by the total amount of, of, of 
money you pay for storage because you're storing a lot more stuff. And and those two those two variables, cost of storage and the amount of storage are difficult to predict uh, over the medium term. They may be relatively easy to predict over the short term or near term, but they're not easy to predict over the medium term. I'll also say that uh, uh, looking at the cost of consumer, uh, like consumer level storage, and by that I mean for things like, and even I say this, it sounds outdated because this is becoming less and less of a thing, but high capacity, you know, USB, USB drives or other kinds of drives that you would you know, put on your home computer to store your videos or whatever. More and more people are going to the cloud for that, obviously. Um, but those kinds of costs do not represent the kinds of costs that the enterprise level storage, the enterprise level storage has. So uh, if you've ever talked to your campus IT about storage costs, uh, you may have seen them uh, hit a point where <laughs> it's cheap, 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 and then you want you know, a large amount of storage, and then for some reason the cost that they quote you is quite a bit disproportionately higher than you thought it was going to be because that enterprise storage is uh, very tiered, and uh, not only tiered by size, but tiered by capability and features. Um, and uh, to move between those tiers for campus IT or any kind of uh, enterprise IT uh, can be extremely expensive. Uh, and, and those costs are not always readily available. They're readily understandable by consumers of the storage service like academic libraries. And I've already alluded to this, but uh, we we don't have a lot of experience with managing the kinds of metadata that repository systems uh, need and uh, generate and the kinds of metadata that you would need to have available to you 50 years in the future or at any point over that that timeline. Um, we just don't have a lot of experience with it. Uh, we do with, with integrated library systems and MARC data because we've been using them well, since the 60s, um, but uh, we have not been using repository platforms for access uh, and and management of our content for more than 20 years. I don't think any of us here have any university libraries here have been digitizing and making accessible content for more than 20 years. And if you look back at my 10 year time or shelf life for a, a platform, that's only two migrations. Um, sure, many of us have undergone many more migrations in that time, but that underscores my point here that we don't have a lot of experience in managing that metadata uh, over time. Uh, particularly things like structural metadata. So that is the kind of metadata that says, here's a book, it has a thousand pages. Here is the order in which these thousand TIFF files need to be presented to the user if, if you're trying to replicate a, a readable book online. That's structural metadata, and we simply don't have a lot of experience uh, managing that over long periods of time. And I would predict it's going to be a lot harder than we think, simply because lack of standards. The, the one the, the 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 reason that we have a lot of experience with successful migrations of mark data is because there's there's kind of one standard and I know you're chuckling when I say that but uh, it is really um, that the, the, the mark format is is pretty consistently understood and implemented across across integrated library systems and little variations in that can be dealt with during migrations but there really is very little in terms of standardization for descriptive metadata. Dublin Core is not really up to the task. Mods, other kinds of things of that nature, um, to a certain extent, they are up to the task. But again, because of, of a lot of inconsistencies in how they're implemented in systems and you know, a lot of options, there's very little consistency across um, Dublin Core and, and, and mods, for example, metadata across implementers, across libraries, very little consistency. Structural metadata, we really have only in the in the GLAM sector, we really only have METS, but METS is so complicated that very, very few of us implement it. And probably is not, it's probably not a viable candidate uh, for expressing structural metadata over time and over systems. 
and across systems. Uh, I mean, th that's that's not fair to say. It is viable. Whether we use it or not is the, the question, and I, I don't think many of us are. So the next threat that I'll talk about and a little bit more quickly than the, the last one is uh, that we as libraries are, have, are challenged to come up with clear organizational, like institutional goals related to access in the future. We have a difficulty imagining what access is going to be like in the future. We have difficulty unless we default to, um, oh, it's going to be the same as it is now. People are going to look at, look, you experience our, con our collections through a web browser. Um, well, that, that may be the case, but you know, what is, what is a web browser going to look like? What is the web going to look like? And what are our users' expectations going to, going to, be, going to be 50 years from now? We don't have very good imaginations when it comes to, uh, uh, ima to uh, imagining um, what access in the future will look like. And that means that we don't have a really good basis on which to work back from to figure out what we need to do between now and then to ensure that that kind of access is, is uh, there's a good chance it's going to, going to be viable. So uh, there are a number of ways we can mitigate this. Um, there are things like external standards and guidelines that we can look to that help us start imagining in concrete terms the kinds of things that we want to, the kinds of access we want to provide in the future and the kinds of things we'll need to do to ensure that access. And I'm going to talk about these three here just as examples of, uh, of again, the, the external standards, um, and I'm using that term very loosely, but external standards that we can use to help us articulate what our access and preservation goals are. And from that, develop a policy, which will get a preservation policy and action plans, which we'll get to in a minute. Many of you will be familiar with the uh, uh, NDSA levels of digital preservation. This uh, versions of this document have been around for quite a few years now. And uh, what it does is basically breaks the con it breaks uh, digital preservation readiness, let's say, uh, or activities into uh, functional areas, storage along the this is along the horizontal uh, rows, storage, integrity, control, metadata, and content, and then defines four levels with uh, achievable concrete benchmarks in each of those four levels to with the specific purpose of, of allowing uh, libraries, for example, to say our goal is level three and we want to be able to do all those things in these categories. And, you know, with this matrix, and then you're, you're then able to, to identify goals that you work toward in your digital preservation program and activity or to on the other hand to assess where you're at now and seeing that where you meet specific uh, uh, criteria in this in this matrix uh, work to rectify the gaps so this is a very useful document for those purposes uh, more recently uh, there is the digital preservation declaration of shared values and this is not so much about technology you'll notice that this this is really the NDSA levels of preservation focus uh, quite a bit on not not pure technology, but but on technology, but applied technology. So things like perform periodic review of actions access logs. This is level four under control. That's not a technology. That's a that's that's a, a review of technology uh, in action. The declaration of shared values really moves away from that technical the technical requirements and functions of digital preservation to more of a values-based approach to it, uh, to digital preservation. And uh, this is useful because, the, as you will get by the end of my presentation, technology is not the answer here. Technology is not going to solve digital preservation for us. Uh, it's necessary, but not sufficient. Um, and any digital preservation policy or framework that doesn't take into account your organization, your institution's values is, is missing an important aspect of, of, of uh, long term, or the provision of long term access. And then things around affordability and sustainability and inclusivity, um, portability and interoperability, these are things that are not surprising to us. But 
I'm, I'm offering this as an example uh, of a kind of approach that you can take to formulating or at least starting to think about if you haven't already your digital preservation uh, strategy. And finally, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the certification uh, of your repository against an ex external uh, checklist is something that many people think of, but then uh, it's not something I think that many of us should be trying to achieve simply because of the enormous cost uh, I think that's involved with with it in most cases, uh, particularly when it comes to things like TRAC, which is the 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 first trustworthy digital repository specification. Um, you may know it as the Magenta Book or you know, ISO 16363, the, the standard. Um, trying to become certified against TRAC is an enormously expensive and organizationally challenging activity. Uh, and I wouldn't, and it's not really designed for uh, individual university libraries. It's more designed for larger scale preservation organizations doing preservation, uh, and some commercial commercial organizations like Portico, for example, have uh, become certified. But I, uh, just to you know, let give me an opportunity to stop talking about track. Uh, there's only six certified repositories in the world. That's how hard it is. Um, so if you want something that's a bit more approachable uh, in, in terms of a external certification um, framework, I would encourage you to look at uh, the Core Trust seal because it is it, it's a direct I think a direct reaction to the complexity and enormity of of track of track certification, and it also shifts the idea of certification and and trustworthiness. Uh, well, trustworthiness in it for sure, more toward community defined standards and not toward a top down, um, you know, uh, international body who uh, defines, uh, you know, what the what the goalposts are and how an organization needs to needs to meet those requirements. So uh, if you if you are looking for something that you uh, want to compare your own activity with uh, that is geared toward compliance. Uh, sorry, uh, certification. Uh, I would recommend the Core Trust Seal. It's it's very approachable, and I also want to recommend the Digital Preservation Coalition's Rapid Assessment Model, the RAM as they call it, or abbreviate it. And this is really an assessment uh, tool. It's not a not necessarily a certification tool or a compliance goal. It's a uh, it's a spreadsheet. It's an Excel spreadsheet and a, um, a guide to filling out the spreadsheet that will let you determine where your gaps are, where your organization's gaps are uh, uh, in a in a set of criteria that are fairly well well articulated and uh, acknowledged to be necessary for successful digital preservation. So again, those those two, the the DCP's rapid assessment model and uh, core trust seal, uh, I'd recommend looking at looking at those if you're looking for something along these lines. I wouldn't even bother with track unless it applies to you, your organization, uh, because of the scale of preservation you're, you're uh, undertaking. Another uh, facet of our lack of imagination when it comes to defining what access will look like in 50 years is the kind of a difficulty in uh, imagining who our users will be. I mean, this is a chronic issue for all of our library, all, all library services, right? We don't really often have a good understanding of who our users are. We may have a, you know, anecdotal or, uh, you know, some kind of a, a, an idea, um, but it, it's rarely, I think it's rarely uh, comprehensive or validated to any extent. And this problem, you know, if this problem is, uh, exists now on a small scale, it's going to exist in a much larger and a more impactful scale when you talk about providing access to your content in 50 years, because we don't know. I mean, I don't think we know uh, how, um, you know, how the web will look or work in 50 years. Um, mobile phones now have, you know, we no one likes to look at a, P at a PDF on their phone, 
Um, and, uh, but we have tablets for that, that it's fine. Uh, so, uh, you know, what, what do mobile, what, what, what is mobile, um, what is a mobile user in 50 years going to look like? What kind of technology are they going to have? And because we can't easily identify the who, we have difficulty identifying the how. Um, but I think it's safe to say that if we identify, uh, if we identify uh, the uh, community, our community in shorter periods, so not our community in 50 years, because that's going to be difficult to, to understand, but our, our community now in five years, in 10 years, you know, kind of like the, the normal uh, scope or scale of a library strategic plan, three, five years, what have you. Those kinds of those kinds of understanding of our audiences and our users can help us determine our, our goals around digital preservation. And I want to just posit a, a thought experiment. Um, many of us have, maybe most of us have special collections units or divisions, and we are often tasked, because these, these special collections, these units are so different from the rest of our services um, and activities, we often have specific goals and um, you know, mission statements, things of this nature for our special collections. And it would be interesting to apply the exercise that exercise of, of coming up with goals and scope for special collections. In other words, what kinds of stuff do we collect locally? Uh, who do we provide access to? Uh, how do we provide that access? Uh, to, I'm thinking here more about physical collections, but to kind of transpose that exercise onto access for digital collections in the future, specifically in the future. Because if we do that, then we may come up with we may come up with some clear goals and some clear ways of thinking about defining how we want to provide access over time. Rather than just, you know, putting it on the web, uh, which is something that I know Simon Fraser was guilty of, certainly in the early years of our of, of digitizing content. We didn't think about who our audience was. We just we were more interested in quantity, not quality so much. And we didn't think a lot about uh, these these issues, these questions, and particularly didn't think about who our users were. Um, so I mentioned a few minutes ago preservation policies and frameworks, and I just want to say you probably this is not new to anyone, I don't think, but these are written expressions. These are documents that express an institution's digital preservation commitments and goals. And not many of us have these. There are some out there. Um, and I would point to York University Libraries as probably the best that I know of in Canada, um, particularly for a, a, a library of its size. Uh, and I understand that you're going to have a, a webinar for, uh, by Nick Rue uh, next week or in two weeks, and uh, I'm sure he'll be showcasing his digital, uh, the digital preservation policies from York. SFU has one as well. Um, I think it's a good framework, but it doesn't really but it's not it's, it's comprehensive as a framework but it is not comprehensive in terms of its action plans so here i'm distinguishing between the framework which is the high level you know policy or high level framework in which document in which you identify institutional goals and and uh commitments typically not a lot of technology is mentioned in the uh, in the in the uh, policy or framework the specific technology and processes and Ver verifiability of those processes is often expressed in separate documents called action plans. And these are often uh, tuned specifically to one set of content. So, um, you know, born digital content and special collections, uh, research data, things of that nature, because some of those groups of content may have uh, special or specific requirements around access in the future and preservation in the present and the near term. Next thread is unclear roles for library and other staff, and this is this is really endemic. Uh, we don't really like every other activity we do. If we don't have clarity around which person or people in the library are doing what, it's not going to get done in any systematic manner. Um, and the oversimplification here is that. Many of us have thought and said 
oh, uh, pres isn't preservation a technical thing? Can't the can't the IT group take care of it? Um, and I want to just dispel that oversimplification. It is not just library IT or campus IT or whoever is, is managing the on the ground technology that needs to do this. It is everyone. And in particular, it is leaders in the library. So university librarian, dean of libraries, whatever that role is called, um, it, depending on the relationship that they have, the library has with uh, campus IT, maybe the chief information officer will be involved. But this is someone who at a, at a senior administrative level in the university, and pardon me for being specific to universities here, but uh, the senior, a senior champion at the university understands that digital preservation is complex, potentially costly, and that it has specific goals to achieve and, and that those goals align with the university's mission and values. Without that senior leadership, that that nothing's going to happen or we're still things are going to happen but in a haphazard manner and not coordinated not coming together to uh, form a cohesive whole uh, and the chances of that kind of activity uh, facilitating access in 50 years are very close to zero so university librarian needs to be on board and they need to be able to uh, articulate the need for digital preservation and they need to be able to allocate funds, for example. These are the kinds of roles that this person uh, functions this role would have. There also needs to be someone on the ground who is familiar at a, on a technical, sometimes on a technical level, but also on a kind of big picture level about how all this fits together. And I'm calling that the operational lead. But this could be the digital preservation librarian. There are a few of those across the country, not a whole lot. Uh, there are a lot of digitization librarians um, or repository managers. These people need to have the big picture in mind so that they know who to go to when they, who their sponsor is when they need money or need to make a pivot. Um, but they also need to understand the role of all of the parts of the ecosystem involved in digital preservation. The repository, the digitization workflows, adherence to standards or good practice, um, the kinds of things that, that uh, the kinds of activities that, that support access, ongoing access across migrations of uh, platforms, for example, uh, IT staff have certainly have a, a, an important role uh, because they are they need they need to be able to to ensure that the techno technology part of this activity is robust and reliable and does what it's intended to do. And as I said earlier on about uh, you know people like uh, frontline librarians talking to departmental reps who want to put stuff in the IR. Uh, you know, the clarity around what that the services are and how they articulate and their independent and combined relationship to digital preservation and continued access is extremely important. Another uh, um, threat that we have is that we are very easily distracted by technology, uh, extremely easily distracted by technology. And I already uh, Gave you my punchline here, but technology is not the not the way to digital preservation. It is necessary, absolutely necessary, but it is not sufficient. Uh, you can't. Technology alone will not ensure access in 50 years. Simple as that. You have to have an organizational structure around uh, the the goal, the shared and understood goal of of providing access in 50 years, and technology is necessary to achieve that, but it can't do it on its own. So you have individual technologies like the things I list here, and those all do one thing really well, or do one thing, but uh, they are not, any one of those is not going to ensure access in 50 years. No, no doubt about that. You bring those up and integrate them into a platform like Archimatica, Roundora, DSpace, um, then yeah, then you kind of, see a plan forming right you, there's there's a set of technologies in play here and they are working together to achieve common commonly held goals or commonly identified goals um, but even at that level at the platform level uh, they are not alone with uh, alone they are not going to uh, to ensure uh, ongoing access they need to have an organizational foundation in which to work and that organizational foundation is digital preservation policy or framework and action plans. And that is where 
the, the your institution's commitments to access in the future and commitments to the kinds of resources that uh, are required to ensure that access digital preservation uh, activities for example uh, that's where that is expressed it is a, it is not expressed in a just a list of activity list of technologies another oversimplification or well another threat uh, and i think it is an oversimplification is tr trusting traditional it um, again, necessary but not sufficient. IT is not going to, uh, campus IT is not going to understand digital preservation unless you've been really working with them for a lot of years. They have entirely different timelines, entirely different goals. They don't understand the business case, and that's because we haven't been able to present it. Um, but I think a lot of campus IT units are now understanding that uh, that libraries want to work with them and that neither the library nor campus IT can do this on its own. That the the relationship with campus IT is going to be successful only to the extent that you can uh, express the business case or the, or the need for digital preservation as it is distinguished from backups, for example, uh, which is something that they will understand. They're not going to understand access in 50 years. They're going to understand access in case files are lost because they want to get the business back on on track. Uh, but for them, 50 years is way too far in the future. They're not going to be around. They don't care. We care. Uh, another uh, threat is our, mm, not blind, but our, <laughs> I think our overly generous trust in commercial service providers. Uh, and this applies to both proprietary and open source service providers. I'm not distinguishing or prejudicing against, open, against proprietary. Uh, so it, this is all service providers who, uh, generally speaking, uh, their commitments to you are limited to the language in the contract. Um, and that's all you can expect. So if you look at the contract and it says, well, we give, you know, uh, either party can give six months notice or whatever the case is, that's what you get. And if that's not, that's going to co complicate your commitments to long-term access, you need to be able to do something outside of that contract, uh, not, not, not to conflict with the contract, but to, or the language in the contract or the service provider's relationship you have with them, but to ensure that when the service provider, for example, says, you know what, we're not gonna do preservation anymore, it's too hard, not enough money in it. So you have six months and we're gonna stop, um, you know, which may be in the agreement. Um, what are you gonna, what can you do now to prevent that from happening? Or at least to mitigate that from ha when it happens. I'm coming up to my last couple of slides here, and I'm sorry I've, I've not gone through this fast enough, but I want to just uh, stop with a, a quotation. This is from uh, the most recently published Effectiveness of and Durability of Digital Preservation and Curation Systems from Ethica SNR, published last July. But um, because no digital preservation system is truly turnkey, digital preservation cannot be fully outsourced. This is what they concluded from their research. Uh, digital preservation is a distributed and iterative activity that requires in-house expertise, adequate staffing, and access to different technologies and systems. While it is possible to outsource key components of the digital preservation process to a system provider, for example, um, I'll add, for example, cloud storage, no digital preservation system is truly turnkey. Today, it is neither feasible nor desirable for a heritage organization to outsource responsibility for its digital preservation program. And what that really means is that we, we can't do it we can't do it on our own without engaging service providers, and we also can't just give it to service providers for them to do. It's got to be a collaboration, but that collaboration means that we need to be able to manage the risk of service providers changing their services or the relationship between us and a particular service provider souring. Uh, and uh, so those those kinds of mitigations happen outside of the your contract, the contract you may have with a service provider. Uh, last uh, threat is our failure to see beyond our institutional borders. And I just want to say here that it is fine for uh, individual institutions to undertake digital preservation activities and to define goals around access into the future. That is fine and expected. You should be doing that. But um, there's going to eventually there's going to come a time when you need you realize you can't do it on your own. And that is when you need to find partners outside of your institutional borders, whether they are regional, like in, like in the Atlantic provinces or in the West in, in Copal, uh, 
what have you, um, but uh, the, you're going to come to that eventually. Uh, and um, the things I list here are all questions that we have uh, around collaborating with others, other institutions. Alignment of shared goals is difficult because sometimes size differences. I know within Copal, there's a, you know, a, I think a tangible uh, tension around the smalls and the larges. I mean, University of Alberta, and you've got the very small members uh, on the other end of the scale, and their their preservation and access goals aren't necessarily going to align easily. Governance and funding is always very challenging, of course. We kind of know that. Sustainability is a big deal. Uh, right now, within a uh, big question and issue, right now within Copal, we're undergoing a kind of a sustainability review for at least one of our shared services. This is West Vault, the shared um, preservation storage. And kind of, you know, as part of sustainability, what happens when uh, we stop being partners? What happens when we stop collaborating and we go our, either our separate ways or we reform our relationships and our collaborations? And what happens to that content? And how does that impact all of our commitments to access? These are things that are difficult, and I'm not going to go into them in any detail because I'm just finishing up here. Um, so there are some current opportunities, though, I see uh, and I want to share with you around collaborating with others. And um, uh, I guess the, the first one is a shift to community based understanding of digital preservation. This is what we're doing here today together. Uh, you asked someone to come in and talk about challenges of digital preservation, and so we have a common understanding of them. And uh, so that's one step in doing that, but also definitions of things like trustworthy. The shift that I mentioned from, you know, track, which says here, here is what trustworthy means, thou shalt comply with these things, to something like the core trust seal, which is more uh, focused on what its community thinks trustworthy should mean. Um, there are in Canada, there are some positive directions in collaborative digital preservation. We in the research data fee, uh, area, we have a domain, we have Borealis and Furter. We have two national level repositories that we can, uh, can choose from if we want to. Um, and there is real interest if, uh, in, uh, on the part of CRKN and the, and the part of CRKN's, many of CRKN's members to explore how the Canadiana Trustworthy Digital Repository um, can be expanded, the services can be expanded such that individual libraries can contribute content to it for preservation services. I just want to end by saying there's two um, other collaborations that I'd like to, to point out to you that may be useful. One is the Internet Archives um, Vault. I, sorry, I have Archive it here. That's that's not part of Archive it. It's separate. It's the Internet Archives Vault service, which is in currently in uh, beta, but this is a service where they'll let you upload stuff for preservation services, preservation storage, for example. And lastly, uh, for things like large newspaper collections, which you may not have the stomach or resources to host locally, but you want to build because of your community, for example, um, involvement with the community, uh, JSTOR will host collections for individual libraries on the premise that they're shareable uh, publicly. Um, and I think we're not, we're just seeing now the start of um, uh, opportunities at this level uh, where individual libraries uh, or groups of libraries can actually participate in services that Internet Archive and JSTOR offer uh, when it comes to um, continued access to our collections uh, and digital and the preservation of access to those collections. Um, I really had hoped to have some time at the end for questions, and I, I didn't achieve that. So I really apologize for not uh, not having giving some time. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I learned a lot, and uh, thank you for the great overview of the critical issues, threats, and opportunities around digital preservation, including the idea of what fundamentally is digital preservation. Um, I, we don't have. Uh, time right now for taking questions because we've come to the end of our hour. But uh, we, if you want to send me, I, I'm just putting it into the uh, chat, uh, your questions, I will collate them and send them on to uh, Mark to try uh, provide as much of an answer as uh, as he is able and would like to. And, uh, and then I can post those with the slide decks sure. and to the website. Uh, or you can also reach out directly to Mark, but um, and, 
And, you know, Cynthia, I'm happy to have a, a follow up session where I don't have mm -hmm. a slide deck. I just if you people want to ha have a discussion, I'm happy to do that as well. So that, that's just an op if you want. That's a great idea, Mark. Um, we will be in touch to set that up. Um, but in the meantime, if anybody has any questions that they wanted to ask uh, related specifically to what uh, Mark had discussed today, uh, please feel free to send them on to me. And I, like I said, I will collate and uh, we will post uh, those questions and uh, the answers to with the webinar recording, the slides and the transcript. Um, and thank you uh, very much, Mark, for your taking your time and uh, for uh, providing us with so much thing, so much food for thought, I guess is the way to say it. Uh, but, so yeah, thanks for inviting me very much, and I appreciate you uh, uh, bearing with me throughout the hour. So thank you. Yeah, and just a reminder, as Mark mentioned, we do have another session coming up in our Digital Preservation and Stewardship series uh, in next Wednesday, uh, the 16th, November 16th at 2 p.m. Atlantic time. Uh, that's when Nick Gruet will be discussing digital preservation at York University, including the policies and frameworks that Mark referenced, uh, but that and a whole lot more. So uh, please feel, uh, please, if you haven't already, uh, RSVP online and we will, uh, I'll make sure to add, give you the access information and we will look forward to seeing you. Uh, I put the link to the webinars page in the chat so that if, uh, if you want to, to come back here and look at the recording later, you will be able to look at it on that site. Thank you all and thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Bye everyone.